Hello everybody, you're welcome back again to the Reggae Appreciation Society. The reggae genre is simply overflowing with outstanding, unique and colorful characters. But no one else personifies the golden era's attitude, culture and ghetto fabulous vibrance like the incredible Big Youth. When he emerged as one of Jamaica's upcoming DJs on the reggae scene, he was stepping into an arena already ruled by red-hot superstars and magnificent toasters like Uroy, Dennis Al Capone and Iroy. But Big Youth broke into the mainstream on the strength of his overflowing talents and stylistic and artistic innovations which had never been seen before in popular music. In more than a five-decade career, he's been celebrated and recognized as one of reggae's true pioneers for so many reasons. But what I find most remarkable about this icon is that he was the first known Rasta dancehall DJ and one of the first people to really bring the Natty Dread culture into the mainstream. When you consider that Rastafarians were social outcasts and looked upon with great suspicion in those times, you begin to understand the impact that he had on Jamaican society and his fellow artists such as the likes of you Roy and even the Whalers, who were emboldened to grow their own dreadlocks after Big Youths began the trend. Now without further ado, and by popular demand, let's take a look at the legendary Big Youth, Dance Hall's first Natty Dread. The story of this Rasta revolutionary began in the most unlikely setting. He was born Manly Augustus Buchanan in Raytown, Kingston on April 1949 to a policeman father and a no-nonsense pastor mother. Growing up in downtown Kingston molded the boy into a tough kid and as he entered into his teens, he began to rebel against his parents' strict rules. At the age of 13, he decided that he had had enough of school and dropped out, chose to become an auto mechanic. He found the apprentice system a bit too slow as he wasn't getting paid yet, so he left that line doing odd jobs for quick cash. In 1964, a young manly found his way to the construction site of the Sheraton Hotel in Kingston and started out as a site laborer until his foreman discovered that he had experience as a mechanic. He was assigned to the crew who were working on the elevator shaft. It was at that post that he would get his legendary stage name and hone the skills that would make him a Jamaican sensation in a few years to come. He was a big towering boy and much taller than his older co-workers at just 15. So his colleagues started calling him Big Youth and the name stuck. While working in the elevator shaft, he would playfully chant and enjoyed listening to his voice echo and reverb in that empty space. He made this an everyday habit and quickly began to get better at putting lyrics together with his ever-growing powerful voice. His colleagues and friends noticed his talent and encouraged him to try out his skills at sound systems. He got the chance to pick up the mic at a dance and the response he received encouraged him to keep trying to get on the mic at sound system events. And by 1970, he had built up a sizable reputation and was beginning to scare already established dancehall DJs everywhere he performed due to his lyrical content which was bursting with social, political and Rastafarian imagery. In those times, DJ's lyrics were mostly light-hearted, disjointed lines about love, partying or what was happening in the dance hall. But suddenly, you had big youth bringing spiritual elements to the sound systems. In the years leading up to those times, big youth had become friendly with Leonard Howell one of the founding fathers of the Rastafarian movement and known by many as the first Rasta. Big Youth also had hung out and reasoned with Rasta elders at a Rastafarian settlement called Bako Wall before it was demolished and rebuilt as Tivoli Gardens. So by the time he turned 20, he had become a full-fledged Rastafarian, much to his family's dismay, but his mind was fully made up. Most sound systems weren't too keen on taking on the skilled but Rasta-oriented toaster until Lloyd Tipperton's sound system gave him a chance and he didn't disappoint and he went on to quickly grow a huge following. That year, Uroy had set the island alight as the first DJ to get a record deal when he released the track Wake the Town and the album Version Galore. It inspired Big Youth to make his own record. He recorded tracks for prestigious labels like Gregory Isaac's African Museum as well as Lee Scratch Perry's Upsetter label. But they barely made a ripple, critically and commercially, in the market. After unsuccessfully recording with Jamaica's established record labels, he tried his luck with a young upcoming producer called Gussie Clark, and that collaboration produced Big Youth's first hit, titled The Killer, and they followed up that success with the track Tipper Tone Rocking, which also did well in the market. These two songs would put Big Youth on the map, but a near fatal accident would inspire a mega hit in the very near future. Big Youth was a keen biker 
and in 1972 and had a terrible accident while riding. It was while recuperating that he was inspired to do a song titled S90 Skank, which was dedicated to his favorite motorbike, the immensely popular Honda S90, and also a cautionary tale about riding it too fast. He hooked up with producer Keith Hudson, and along with his manager Trevor Nelson, aka Lego Beast, they would pull off a feat of creative brilliance when they brought in an actual S90 motorbike into the studio and recorded it being revved to create an awesome sound effect that made the track an immediate sensation in Jamaica, a huge commercial and critical hit that would become his first single to go gold. S90 Skank made Big Youth a superstar and after releasing a slew of singles, he unleashed his debut album Screaming Target in 1972, which was also produced by Gussie Clark. The album was a monster hit, an instant classic that is regarded as one of the greatest dancehall albums of all time. It even overshadowed Uroy's debut, Version Galore, and was simply loaded with hits. Four songs from the album would stay in the Jamaican Top 20 for a whole year. On top of that, his cultural impact was phenomenal. He was one of the first artists to don dreadlocks on album covers and even on stage. He always performed in his hats, but would often drive his audiences wild by quickly flashing his dreadlocks before putting his headgear back on. Interestingly, this was years before the Wailers and others would also start growing their dreads, even though they were already practicing Rastafarians. Big Youth was an electric personality. His sound was phenomenal, but it was also a sight to behold, from his height, stage presence, down to the red gold and green gemstones that he had embedded in his front teeth a fashion statement that was way ahead of his time and unbelievably cool. In those days, Bob Marley who was still on the verge of becoming an international megastar called Big Youth his favorite artist. It's difficult to truly describe his influence on the youth of Jamaica. His street credibility was on a level that no other artist could reach. Jamaica in those times was being torn apart by violence between rival political gangs and Big Youth's lyrics ran commentary on those touchy issues in Jamaica, speaking truth that the media was reluctant to do. And while most of other reggae artists had begun their careers in the mold of American singers, Big Youth came fully formed in an indigenous Jamaican package. He romped into 1974 in imperious form, unleashing hits after hit, and was so hot that at one point he had seven songs on the Jamaican charts and even five in the top ten. He also had the great honor of being the first artist to record with the newly formed i3s, even before they put voice to wax on Bob Marley's Nazi Dread album later that year. But his influence wasn't limited only to Jamaica. After the release of 1975's Dreadlocks Dread and Hit the Road Jack the next year, his fame had exploded over into the UK and he went on to a spectacular tour of Britain in 1979 with Dennis Brown as his opening act. A tour which UK reggae legend Brinsley Ford of Aswad described as one of the most culturally impactful tours by any reggae artist alongside Bob Marley's Exodus tour in that same year. But the difference was, while Bob Marley's music was spiritual and militant in a broad and abstract sense, Big Youth was giving British audiences a gritty street level eye view narrative of life in Jamaica. His concert at the London Rainbow Theatre went down as top of legend and proof of its impact on Britain. Johnny Rotten of legendary punk band The Sex Pistols was a huge fan of Big Youth and after watching the show went backstage where he took some iconic photographs. Big Youth would release a slew of hit albums until the end of the 1970s but the new decade saw his popularity and sales take a dip as dancehall was rapidly evolving and there had emerged a new generation of dancehall DJs like Yellow Man and Barrington Levy. It was a difficult time for many veteran artists who couldn't cope in the new digital era but Big Youth showed immense staying power and though he was less prolific, he still stayed relevant even though he released fewer albums in that decade as well as putting in some fierce performances at the Reggae Sun Splash. And into the 1990s and beyond, he continued to release music sparingly. But don't get it twisted, he's been extremely busy since then on the touring circuit, performing non-stop show after show at some of the biggest reggae festivals on the global stage. His last album, Beyond the Blue, came out in 2021 and he's remained an outspoken critic of the state of the reggae industry today. Big Youth is enjoying himself, living his best life as one of the elder statesmen of reggae and will go down as one of the most pivotal figures in the genre as well as one of the most influential architects of reggae culture as we know and love it today. 
So there you have it. Thank you for watching the video today. Please leave a like, subscribe, and until next time, Jobless.